Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Um, can everybody hear me first of all? Yeah. We have continuous travails with this microphone, but I think it, it does appear to be working for once. Um, so just, I'm going to just give a very brief general overview of the First World War and Prony's sources to it before we get into the most detailed, um, more, more detailed papers. Um, you know, the main purpose this afternoon is the launch of Trevor's book, which is based on Prony's sources, and, uh, and is, which illustrates just how rich the, 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 those sources are. But I'm going to go and try and give a more general overview of material related to the First World War, which is held in Prony. Uh, I probably don't have to tell you that it's the anniversary. Um, I forget how many hundred hours of broadcasting the BBC has lined up over the next four years. The anniversary has been everywhere, and obviously, particularly today, we are we all have been thinking about it. So, the, as the First World War and Germany Partnership set up, as said, we are still all connected to the First World War one way or another either through family history, because we have members of family we know that, that, that took part in the war, or because of the community uh, involvement, you know, we, we all have war memorials in, in, in our local communities. And even beyond that, the impact uh, it has had long term on our own society and on the world, uh, it had a very big impact on Ireland. And uh, we are in the middle of what's been called the decade of commemorations at the minute, looking at the 100th anniversaries of various things from 1912 through to 1921. First World War is extremely important in creating the Ireland that we live in today, North and, and South. They're also creating the world in which we live in today, and you know that the map of Europe was uh, redrawn because of this war. And a lot of the other things that you listen to on the news, events going on across Europe, a lot of those do tie back in many cases to decisions made in the First World War or the aftermath of the First World War, the redrawing of boundaries and things like that. So it is still very much with us, with the war, uh, and the memory of it is still very strong, um, and to a certain extent even more than, than, uh, than the Second World War for many people. Um, my starting point when this, when I, when I was looking at sort of our researches, um, Cyril Falls, you probably know him, distinguished uh, military historian from the north of Ireland, from a the Man of Family wrote in 1922 History of the 36th Ulster Division, one of the first divisional histories to come out. And in the introduction, he makes an interesting observation. He says, A hundred years hence, men will be delving into our records of the late war. Soldiers will be studying the lessons of its battles. But yet a greater number of seekers will be demanding, with curiosity, how men lived in such circumstances, how they reacted to the strain of war, and what compensations they found. And that's quite a perceptive comment. We're a hundred years on from that, and yes, we are. And the, the, the war has been studied even more than, 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 than in, in the immediate aftermath. People are looking at the military history of it still, but a greater number of uh, the, the greater part of the interest in the war now is on what you might call the social history of the war. It's it's how the war affected people, how men and women reacted to the war, how they got through it, how it changed them. So that has been the emphasis in, in the recent years in the in the historiography of the war. And that is what Brony, I think, is very strong in the sources for. We don't have the official records of the war, we don't have regimental records, but we do have the records of individuals who lived through the period, either as participants or as spectators. And it's those records there which allow us to see how the war affected ordinary men and women. Um, the scale of the war, as I said, we probably don't have to emphasize to you, particularly today of all days, um, but in Ireland, 210,000 men and women approximately served. It's difficult to come up with an exact figure because the number who served in um, Canadian, Australian, even American units. But um, people born in Ireland, probably about 200,000, probably 10% of the male population of Ireland uh, in those years actually was involved. Uh, and again, the figure for the number that were killed is problematical, but probably in, the, in excess of 30,000. 13% casualty risk, which is about normal for, 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 for the armies of that period. So it's a very big loss and a very big involvement uh, in the war. Um, and again, I probably don't need to have, have to emphasize it. You know, there have been two traditions are, of looking at the war, uh, traditionally in Ireland. Uh, nationalists and unions have tended to take different views of the war. Um, either looking back to the Easter Rising or looking back to the sacrifice of men uh, actually on, on, on battlefields. But I think that recent years uh, there's been a recognition that this is very much a shared experience. Both nationalists and unionists, Protestant Catholics, both, were, both went to the war, both became involved in the war, and the war is important in, in the way that the Ireland develops. 
So the two, well there is two, two narratives there, they are becoming more closely entwined to a certain extent. <coughs> Prony itself, just to give some, some context, uh, if you haven't been here before, uh, we are established in 1924, not that long after the ending of the war. We are, to a certain extent, was, you could argue, coming out of the, the changes wrought by the war. The partition of Ireland in 1922, or in 1921, and particularly the destruction of the Public Record Office of Ireland in Dublin in 1922. This leads to the Northern Administration establishing its own record office in 1924. And when the Northern Record Office is set up, as well as being this repository for the government records of the new administration and public bodies, it is also, um, they also try to go beyond that and bring in records from ordinary people. Um, about 60% of our holdings do not, come from the, do not come from government, they come from ordinary individuals, companies, businesses. And it's those records which give, I think, the, the sort of detail, the, the great detail, uh, they're going beyond the official story and into personal lives. Give an example of the sort of material that we that will include. For instance, the diary of Jules Wood. Julius Wood was a soldier who served with the King's Liverpool Regiment throughout the war, survived nearly three years as an infantry soldier uh, at the front, and left a very detailed journal, um, which is deposited here. This was later republished uh, by his family a few years ago. But it is a very much an ordinary soldier's day-by-day -day account of life as it's lived. He doesn't focus very much on battles. He doesn't talk about what's going on in the trenches very much. He, he, that's not where his life has lived. He talks about what they did outside the trenches, what they did when they were out of the front line, what consolations they found. It's very fixated on food because they were all worried about where their next meal was coming from very often. Um, the published version is called Six to a Loaf because they sort of rated their, their, their happiness by how many people are actually sharing a standard army issue loaf of bread at lunchtime. And quite a lot of it is what they're doing in their spare time, how, 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 how they're putting the time. And so it's a very interesting account from below uh, of a soldier's life. We also have records which take people beyond, um, not only beyond Ireland, but beyond the traditional fixation on, on the Western Front. Robert McDowell, uh, an accountant uh, or bookkeeper from Bangor, he ends up in Russia with the Royal Navy Armoured Car Unit. Very interesting story. It's a very interesting unit which ended up with um, over 100 men from the north of Ireland uh, in it. They, in um, 1916, they end up in Russia, and on Boxing Day 1916, actually ends up in Bulgaria, sorry, in Romania, fighting Bulgarians. Just to give you an idea of how complex the First World War could become. Uh, so it's taking people all over the world. And um, Robert McDowell keeps a very interesting diary of his kind and photographs. That's one of the photographs. And that's his armoured car, which is called Ulster, somewhere in Russia in late 1916 with the Russian liaison officer standing beside it. The other guy there, the, uh, the, the, the tall man there, is Walter Smiles, later MP, um, who was killed in the, uh, when the Princess Victoria sunk in 1953, interesting enough. So there's all sorts of connections there with that unit. And Robert, when he went out to, to Russia, they stopped off in a small town in the Ukraine uh, on their way through. He went out one day, took a walk down the main street of this backwater town in the Ukraine, and heard he meet? He met a woman from next door neighbour from Bangor. Um, she had been out there, not with this lot, not with the armoured cars, but with this group. Scottish Women's Hospital. Now I won't say very much about this because it's getting into Anne's territory. But the, these these ladies uh, had joined, had formed their own medical unit, and they ended up in Serbia and in the south of Russia. And so they meet up with with with, with Robert Durer. So there's men and women from Ireland going all over the world as part of this war, and it is changing them again. And we'll talk about it later. But you can look at that photograph and work out how it's changed those particular women, the experience of the war. Um, other papers we would have, very important collection, would be Major General Sir Oliver Nugent, the officer who commanded the 36th Ulster Division throughout the war. Um, very interesting from the military history point of view because you get an explanation of how he trained those men and how he organised those big battles, particularly the Battle of the Somme. His papers on the planning for the Battle of the Somme are very interesting, including the original maps and all the rest of it. So very much high level military history. But they're also a personal account. He wrote to his wife nearly every day. 
that letter up there is one of the first letters he sent after the first day of battle was solved. He writes to his wife immediately on the 2nd of July and then again on the 3rd of July. And you get his immediate reaction to the slaughter on the first day of the Solom, where he writes to tell her, first of all, that, that he's okay, and then to give her some idea of the casualties and what the, what, what the division's been through. You mentioned in that letter on the 3rd, 5,200 casualties that the Ulster Division has taken during, during that one day's fighting, and tells her that if they're still fighting, they're going to have to be withdrawn from the line. And he actually goes on to say the great point and say the Ulster Division no longer exists as a fighting force as a result of the sacrifice on the first day of the song. So you're getting those immediate reactions from, from the men at, at the front line. You're getting, as I say, a lot of other material about actually planning of the war and how the war is, is, is organised. That's the map we used for planning the first day attacks on, on the Battle of the Somme. <coughs> those of you that have been to France, uh, the Ulster Tower, the Ulster Tower is just about up there on that map, and it's just inside the German lines. It's actually built on that battlefield. You can see people wood, which you can now get taken into to get to have a look at those positions which were in people who were just behind the German lines on, on the first day of the song. So that's his planning map for that. You, you get these little incidental reminders of just what the war is all about. This is one of the force orders I put up there with it. It's a rather a grim one. It's got this very innocuous title, Clearing the Battlefield. But it's explaining to the men who haven't been into a major battle before what they will have to do in the aftermath, basically how they're going to get the dead and wounded off the battlefield, what they have to do, they have to get the casualties out. He's giving them, I won't go into it in too much detail, but it's quite grim reading because he's going to the reality of how you actually deal with a large amount of casualties and little grim things like make sure there's a medical officer sent to our medical order, they go to every burial party and just check the people that you're burying are actually dead. Little things like that, which they have to bear in mind, and how you're going to have to maybe just throw men on the shell holes and throw some soil on top of them, that's all you can do. So it's a very real, it's grim reality, it's a wonderful reality of just what, what war is like. Uh, on the front line for, for men. And we don't just have stuff from the British side, the majority of it is obviously from soldiers who, who fought uh, with our Irish units, but there are other bits and pieces, including a few bits and pieces from German soldiers. Um, these are often picked up as souvenirs by men who found them lying around trenches, or maybe lying around, maybe taking off dead bodies. Uh, quite a legitimate thing to do if you come across anybody dead to take papers to check for intelligence information. So you got this very poignant letter just to a German soldier from his family, just writing back to him to tell him uh, some family news, postcard him for some of his mates, and little things like that, which are exactly the same as the stuff that you're getting from the British soldiers, and just a reminder of the common humanity, uh, which is involved in war. Uh, another very interesting source we have is um, Chaplin's records, with two, records of two or three Chaplin's. Robert Kelso was a Presbyterian minister, from Broad Mills, he's a chaplain um, at there um, at this stage when that book was done. He was attached to one of the hospitals. Uh, the chaplains have a lot of functions, but one of the ones is to organise the burial of, of soldiers who died in rear areas, particularly the ones that died in hospitals. So he's issued with this burial return book, and he keeps his notes of the people that he's bodied and that he buried, and also the notes of the next of kin, because his job is then to write to the families, to try and explain to the families what's happened. So that's just one page where he buried five men from 16th Royal Irish Rifles, which is County Down, you know, County Down, uh, Second County Down Volunteers. He buried those five guys, they were killed with one shell uh, in, in April 1918, buried them in a place called Canada Farm uh, in the Eap Salient, wrote, wrote to, to their next of kin. Um, I, that's in there to illustrate that this could be a starting point for research. We did a little research project on these five names was able to get a lot about their family background. And the main exhibition I cited, there's their interactive screen, one of the interactives is based on, on these five guys. So you're able to recreate their, their lives. Five ordinary people from mainly working class or agricultural neighboring families from County Down, all killed in that one incident. As I say, all buried together uh, in graveyard, a very remote place, as my colleague can testify, um, uh, several miles outside Eep. Um, and that's the sort of letters. Kelso's records contain these books of letters where he's writing every day to yet another family and explain that what happened to or try to explain what happened to, to, to their son, heartbreaking task for him. 
So that's just another way of looking at the war and, and the chaplains. We have two or three very interesting chaplains collections. There's uh, Kelso and a guy called Dwyer Kelly, who is a Methodist chaplain, is quite interesting. And we also have, you know, records of the fighting, uh, men who want to talk about what they've gone through. Particularly important and vivid collection is William Montgomery, um, who is writing back to his parents quite regularly. Command, he was a company commander with 9th Royal Irish, the West Belfast Volunteers. Letters are very grim, I won't uh, do any of them today because they are very grim. Uh, he doesn't spare anybody anything uh, about what the reality of war is like in, in, in trenches, how difficult it is to keep men motivated, to keep men at it uh, all day, but they're certainly worth looking if you want to see what the reality of war is and what it does to people, particularly somebody like him who is obviously quite a sensitive man, though he tries to pretend not to be, and you get a good picture from those of the sort of stresses that men had to go through from, from those letters. And there's lots of other individuals there. Um, we have done a guide, Steve mentioned in passing, which is on the website now. There are some copies lying around that table if you want to take a hard copy. Um, your last chance to get a free printed one before they cut it. Um, <laughs> uh, but it is a free bit of you to take it off the, uh, off the website. Um, which gives you uh, an overview of some of the other collections, but I just mentioned a few of them there. Sam and William Montgomery. None of the Montgomery's are related to me, by the way. Sam and William Montgomery from Cumber. Jim Davison, quite well-known figure of, of the Scirocco Works, uh, from, from East Belfast, and my like, family actually lived in Bangor, died in the first day of the song. Birch Stitt from East Belfast, highly entertaining letters, back to his family from a guy who's only interested in food, he would appear, and girls. <laughs> Max Cochrane, very interesting, his last letter home to his family, just before the Battle of the Song, that becomes his will, because he didn't leave a will, and the family had to take that letter back down and use it as well because he sent a letter and go into this big battle I may not survive and here's what I want you to do with my money. Sammy Shaw, fisherman from Port Stewart, interesting, and Frank Savage Armstrong, regular army officer from Port of Ferry, very, very vivid accounts of the early days of the fighting. There's also a blog which we have on the website which we're updating monthly of accounts. This month's features Frank Savage Armstrong's early accounts of the first day, opening days of the first battle of Eve. We we'll also have accounts from civilians as well, um, again in that, oh, the blog, in the opening one for, for August, girl, uh, actually Savage Armstrong's sister, I think it was Gwen Savage Armstrong, she's in school in France when the war starts, she has to be brought back home, she has to travel across France while the French army is mobilising, so there's a wonderfully descriptive and quite excited letter from her of what it's like trying to get these schoolgirls across France with the French army mobilising all around them and the sights of all these soldiers everywhere at, at all the stations and all the, all the emotion of the soldiers who are dressed in their the uniform the French army started the war in with the red trousers uh, and the blue jackets before they worked out fairly quickly that wasn't a good idea. Uh, well I'm not saying more about women because I'm a much better speaker on that subject coming up. Um, but uh, other aspects of the war would be things like fundraising. Uh, again, there's a big charitable. Uh, people want to get involved in helping with the war. So there's a lot of charitable organizations set up this range from knitting socks, so again, I'll be happy talking about that, to actually raising money for various functions. Uh, so it's come a nice, nice photograph we found. Uh, if you're listening to me on downtown radio earlier on, I was trying to describe this in the radio, which didn't work very well. Um, but this, is, this donkey has been auctioned off in um, August or September 1914 to raise funds for Belgian refugees. So it's been auctioned in Finley's sales rooms in Bangor. And uh, a gentleman contacted us when we published it to say it was his father, I think, or grandfather was the auctioneer. So we now know that it went for 50 shillings. The donkey doesn't look very impressed now, is the child sitting on it? There you go. And there's quite a lot of uh, the other fundraising going on. Quite a lot of, also you don't think about it, there's quite a lot of unemployment at the start of the war. The war disrupts the whole economy, people put out of work, so there's actually a lot of fundraising just to get to get people jobs in the early days of the war, before the war industries sort of kick in. Again, I shall leave my colleague to talk about that. Other ways the war affects people, you don't often think about it possibly, is the submarine campaign, Germans launch, trying to, uh, because Britain uh, imported most of its food before the First World War. You don't hear as much about the First World War submarine campaigns here at the Second World War, but it is quite effective and it comes very close to actually winning the war from Germans at one stage. 
So you have German submarines working all the way around Ireland. We know about the Lusitania being sunk in the south of the Irish Sea, but there are, submarines are actually operating off the north coast. They're, they're sinking fishing boats off Kilkeel, for instance, because they're operating that far north in, in the Irish Sea. That letter there we found from a fisherman. Uh, it's written in 1922, but he's writing to his MP to say that his father's fishing boat had been sunk by the Germans in 1918. His father had bought this with a loan from the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. He was still paying off the loan uh, in 1922, and he hadn't got any compensation uh, for this. So it's one of the ways, another way, you possibly don't think that the war is actually coming home to people in Ireland quite directly. Recruitment is another area which is interesting to look at here, how, how people are recruited, what, um, how they try to appeal to people. It's quite interesting to look at the, the recruiting material. You see the use of Irish images quite a lot, Irish iconography. They're trying to appeal to nationalist as well as unionist sentiments, so you get that quite famous poster there called Their Arms, Irishmen Don't You Hear It, which has got no British um, symbolism at all. It's all appealed to Irishmen to join an Irish army which is fighting this war. And also the sporting metaphor coming through, you know, grand international football match to be held uh, on the continent, Britain, Ireland and the Allies against Germany. So appealing to young men's sporting instincts. That poster's from 1915, that sort of approach doesn't work later in the war. And another aspect of the war of course is the Easter Rising. It is part of a of a different story of um, the struggle for home rule Irish independence, but it's also part of the First World War as well. We do have a number of first hand accounts of it, of the fighting in Dublin. Some postcards up at this particular guy, Ron, Ronnie Whelan. Uh, that's quite an interesting account, a very conflicted guy, um, working class Dublin Protestant who has friends on both sides. He's working, uh, he, he's a Red Cross volunteer attached to the British Army, but he's friends on the Republican side, and he actually crosses the lines on a couple of occasions and tries to talk to his friends on the Republican side to try and talk them out of taking part in, in the rising. So man, I'd say both sides of it. And then there's the whole culture of memorial itself, all the memorials in the, uh, after, uh, in the aftermath of the war. The Thiebaud Memorial uh, in France is probably the best known of, of these. Uh, that's the visitor's book for Thiebaud from the, from the early 20s. Um, so there's quite a lot to be learned about how people remembered the war. So all this stuff is available on the website. Um, the, the guide is there now as well. The blog is there uh, on the front page of, of the website. And the, uh, the whole point of all this is to get people to do further research and more research and, and use this material. We do feel it's been underused. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there that hasn't been looked at. So we're hoping that the war will kick off re research and people will not just sort of passively watch the television programs or come to lectures, but will actually get in and start researching themselves. Normally, I sort of think funny sort of questions here, but I think... Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming along. It's such a great, dispirting day such as this. So, my name is Brett Irwin, member of the private records team at Prony. I'm here to talk about Lady Lundgren and the Great War. So, I'm I want to look at four major aspects of her role and association with, with the war. The uh, first one will be her work in the formation of the Women's Legion, which was a voluntary, uh, a quasi-military movement that went on to pave the way for greater things. The second part of the talk, I'm going to look at the ARC, which is a distinct social club formed by Lady Laundrie and Parkley in London in 1915 which had some surprising members and some interesting personas that they adapted, which we'll come to much later. The other two aspects of the talk are going to be about Lady Lundry's encounter with Zeppelin in London, which she, she writes really vividly about. And finally, letters from the Western Front from some of her military friends that are of such insight that they would surely have, uh, they just reveal really what's going on the very early days of the war. So, Lady Lundry, leading light of London society, was a glittering socialite, a symbol of wealth and power. She played a leading role in the British social and Irish political life, from her estate in Mount Stewart, County Down, which you may, which you may know, now the Hanson National Trust, but also from Londonry House, Park Lane in London, where she's really centred for the duration of the war, where a lot of the activities she's involved in take place in London. I mean, said she inspired all, all affection to equal measure. Many find her energy and enthusiasm hard to resist, but she's obviously much more than a grand dame. 
She was devoted to helping women to search for equality. Sometimes against very personal criticism from the British establishment, she strove to give women the vote and challenge views held at that time regarding women and their role in society. So she also inspired great loyalty and confidence in her many military friends who served in the front line. And it must be said, well behind it in the Western Front. She received insights in the, in the, in the, the conditions of the war, particularly at the, particularly at the start when people were still this kind of great adventure held by the press. She was getting facts and figures sent through. That surely would have bypassed military censorship. And she was really, really well informed of what was going on. Due to her connections, not only was her husband out there, I was ADC to General Putney, but he was kept well behind the lines due to her influence. But some, some of her friends serving, really, such was her, her friendships, they really told her things, which, which we'll look at when, when we come to. So, moving on. Let's see. <clears throat> That's the House of Mount Stuart, which you all know. It's a very early photograph of Edith Lundwick in 1916. Postcard just found that recently. So, launched in July 1915, this is the formation of the Women's Legion. There's other women's groups around, but this is one that she really put her heart and soul into. So, formed in 1915, the Marchioness of Lundwick. Women's Legion became the largest entirely voluntary women's organisation to assist with the war effort. Although it wasn't formally brought under government control until 1917, so it was still being resisted by the British authorities to militarise women and to see women in uniform genuinely spooked a few people. So this was kind of this was taking this quasi-military structure. So they, they did adopt a military style structure and a uniform. Uh, so the, the women's leads of volunteers became involved in many forms of work, including cooking, catering, driving for the army, and working in agriculture. This was seen initially as to get women involved in the war, but more importantly as the war progressed, it helped to free up men to go and serve at the front, and why vital work was being, was being done on the home front. So this was seen as this became essential work, essential war work. So there, there's no doubt that Lady Laundrie worked tirelessly, uh, expanding the role, sorry. So there was this sort of worked really hard to break down the barriers, the, the opposition to this. I mean, as she says here, I'll just like to have a wee read, read of that. <clears throat> Quite in, within certain circles in the establishment, a common view. Women, women are kept out of the war, not allowed to be in the war. They want them in uniforms walking around, they're going to give them guns next. I mean, this real hostility and personal criticism towards her as well about this. But she was insisting that if given the opportunity, women can make a major, a major contribution to the war effort. So indeed, in 1916, she's approached by the War Office to form a Corps of Women Drivers from the Women's Legion who have experience for Tribalese men at the front. So the, the army is starting to take this seriously and take this on board. So this, this, this women's auxiliary, these drivers of, in the Army Corps were recruited from the Legion and drafted into the Royal Army Service Corps. So they're actually becoming more formalised. <coughs> it's the Women's Legion badge, that's the motto. Ora e labora, pray and work. <clears throat> That's a driver. As we know, it looks strange. He looks like Edith herself, though nobody will prove it. Again, from, from the Pony Records, drivers. And again, you see that military, that uniform. You know, and, and, and the pride in themselves with that. I mean, this is quite a sight to see women being paraded, staying in camps and barracks, marching up and down, doing these kind of quasi military activities. They spoke a few people. <clears throat> That's one of the camps. I just found that photograph recently, which wasn't in my earlier talk. So, again, gives more, more of an insight to see the structure, how it's run, what it's doing, how it looks. So, not only was Lady Laundry involved in the Women's Legion, she was also involved in a contribution to the YMCA. And the YMCA at the stage of the war, what they were doing was even bringing, uh, sort of bringing medical supplies over, bringing material over to rest stations. Rest stations were very important because they give soldiers in the front line a chance to go and get a cup of tea, sit and write a letter, pen, pencil, paper, something to just relax, to get letters sent home. Very important troops. The YMCA was really fundamentally involved in this work and started putting these relief stations out, rolling them out closer and closer and closer to the front line. So we have an example here. Do we have a clicker working? Is it? 
what if I click or miss this? So it's, it's certificate ID, travelling, the signature, and the date, the photograph, on behalf of the YMCA. Again, so interesting is Princess Helena's auxiliary. So it's the work with that. <coughs> Customs documents signed by the French ambassador in London, so this is completely, nothing's to be searched, she's allowed complete transit through to France. So again, the kind of uh, altitude that she's really dealing with, or flying at, you know, at this stage. <coughs> again, military authorities travel pass from the British Army, signed by Sir John Cowan, who's the Major General, Quartermaster of the whole British Army. So again, the, the people, the work she's doing has been signed off at the very, very top. <clears throat> another similar document travel past there. <clears throat> so this is another example of some of the other groups that, that were formalised by this, by the advent of the creation of the Women's Legion. When the, when the uh, British Army started to formalise, bring these organisations in, they did come into various other groups. It's the Women's Forestry Corps. Again, helping to do vital agriculture work at home, free up men for the front. Formalised and brought in 1917, Women's Land Army, we know it more popular from, from the Second World War, but again, formed in, formed in the first. <clears throat> Formalised, adopted again, Women's Legion, an influence in that. You may have mentioned earlier, I just love this photograph. It's not really relative to Lady London during, but it's, it's another women's organisation formed the Scottish Women's Hospitals that wanted to fight in Serbia. And it was Elsie English, uh, Dr. Elsie English, I think, who formed this. When she went to the war office to say, I have volunteers, I have nurses, we can go out and do some work. She was told to go home and sit still. So this was the attitude. But not that she did that. She went to Serbia. She mobilised and ended up, there was something in the region of 20 field hospitals in that particular front in Greece and Serbia in the Eastern Theatre in the First World War. And I believe she has a street named after her in Belgrade. At home, she's a footnote. Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, they're doing this vital work doing the graves, see, 1917. Again, another, f another reflection of the formalisation of women into the British Armed Services during the First World, World War. <coughs> so, we're going to, so, just sort of, uh, just to, just to uh, summarise in the first part of the talk. So, you, you could argue, I mean, the, the, the success of the Women's Legion was a definite factor in influencing the government to organise female labour along the official lines. We've seen examples of that. I mean, Lady Lundry's contribution was formally recognised by being awarded the Order of Knighthood of the British Empire in 1917. So there can be little doubt the contribution of this Women's Legion and the Women of the Great War helped to pave the way for the representation of the People Act of 1918, when 8.4 million women gained the right to vote. So it did play a part, without a doubt. This is just another part of the talk I want to move on. This is a relatively new feature. I find I find some letters, and I just think it was really compelling, really, really interesting. When she talks about a Zeppelin raid, one of the first Zeppelin raids over London. <coughs> um, if I may quote here, she first sees a Zeppelin. She goes out. She's at the house in Park Lane. She sees the destruction. These things are lighting up, illuminating the skyline of London by their by the destruction and havoc they're costing, but there's also, there's also something very compelling about seeing this. You're almost mesmerised by these things. No one's seen this before. And to see these things coming over and raining down the sheer terror and destruction in London, I mean, it's absolutely out of this world. It's a science fiction here. This is science fact. So if I may quote something here, <clears throat> the first encounter of these Zeppelins, she says, At last silence reigned, and I was just returning upstairs when I heard a noise outside. I went on to the balcony overlooking Hartford Street, and there, through the falling pieces of soot and odds and ends, I saw a zeppelin. I could scarcely believe my eyes. It was a huge sausage balloon-like contrivance. Compared to modern standards, it was flying at a very low height, and looked as if it was floating over the end of Hartford Street before it disappeared out of sight. It's the most thrilling thing I've ever seen. So these things are compelling. They're absolutely astounding. <clears throat> So this is the more the pragmatic and destruction of what they actually are there for, what they actually do. So we, we do have a account there of this aftermath of a Zeppelin attack in parts of London that were completely devastated by it. But I just, I'm very taken with this phrase, it was terrifyingly beautiful. I just, I just find it really compelling about that, where you couldn't look away from it, but you knew it, it was horrible, it was destructive, it was wrong, but there's something about it. You've never seen this before. So... I'm going to talk now about the arc. 
which is a, a very unique, curious aspect of Lady London in the First World War. It's a kind of select social club established by Lady London in 1915, based in Londonry House, partly in London. The purpose of the club is to provide relaxation during the war years for what they call King's Messengers, people involved in the war work, coming and going, friends, personal friends of hers, just to get a sanctuary. It's a place of safety, companionship during these war years. So you go to bed every Wednesday afternoon, like a supper club, card, you know, relaxation, drinks, talks. But it had another interesting facet, because it, it kind of reflects Lady Lunder's personality. She called herself Circe, the enchantress from Greek mythology. I got that slide in there. And so she wanted all the members to be to be known as an animal, a bird, or a mythological name, but had to bore some alliterative relationship to their own name. So therefore Churchill, for example, was Winston the Warlock, Admiral Lord Beatty was David the Dolphin, we'll see these figures. Uh, they kind of it was their own little calling cards into this world. It does sound now extremely silly, extremely self-indulgent, and what was the point of any of this? But there is a certain seriousness to it. And also, it also gets people away from the war, from the realm. The horrors of the First World War in 1915 has become apparent how dreadful it actually is. So it seems to have lasted throughout the Second World War. And it did play host to many distinguished figures in politics and society during the interwar years as well. So Lady Under was going to contemplate and write a history of it, but just before she died in 1959. So that's Cersei. It's a drawing we got found in the archives, which I like. You know, the, uh, and we've seen Theseus or Jason and the Argonauts or anything, you recognize the crew returned into the swine and all this kind of, all these aspects. You know, it does sound really silly, but there's, there's a sort of, some of the members of, there's Simon the Silkworm, Sir John Simon, who had the distinction of holding the three major cabinet posts in the British government, Home Secretary, Chancellor, Foreign Secretary. So it wasn't just people walking in off the street for this. They were invited, Queen, Queen Bee, Lady Pembroke, Montgomery. We do also have some caricatures relating to the ark, which are really priceless. We don't have an awful lot, but we do have some that are of interest. Just a form of membership and the kind of persona they adopted. It's like their membership card of this little select club. So you Cecil, Linky the Lemur, we should have a drawing. He's one of my favorites. You Cecil, my conservative MP, uh, leader of the Uligans when he was at Oxford. A very, uh, a very distinct person. I do like Linky the Lemur. Lady Janet Duff Cooper, a famous socialite actress of the time, Diana the Huntress. Uh, very, very lovely, lovely sketch over there. Just give a flavour of the members. Sorry, it's a third. Charles, the seventh Marquis, her husband, Charles the Cheetah, reading that what you will. But I, I thought I had a non smoking one, but I obviously when can only find the smoking one. There's two of these. Uh, Winston the Warlock. So this is the kind of idea. Lloyd George, I love this one, Lloyd George, George the Griffin. The kind of magnitude, the kind of interesting, the, the selection of people who were invited in. And it was famously, it did serve a political purpose. Edith effectively secured Lundry's place, the centre of politics during the war, in her home. People were meeting in her home to talk, to discuss, and she would have been privy to all of this. And it kind of secured her house being the base and her family and her name being the centre of what was going on during the First World War, and, and people, there was people who criticised this as being, this is outrageous, this is just silly, self-indulgent. But as Lady Carson famously remarked, the Ark, and she says, it's not as silly as it sounds, and outsiders are inquisitive, also very jealous. So basically, if you weren't, you weren't invited into it, you can play all, all you want, but you weren't getting into it. Duchess of Portland, Ivy the Ivis, lovely one there, the hero of the world. Jutland, the Battle of Jutland, Admiral David B.D. David the Dolphin is quite interesting because he always has this rakish angle of his hat, again reflected in the caricature. <coughs> Lord Balfour, Arthur the Albatross, apparently called the Albatross because everything he said went over everyone's head. <coughs> so there is, a, it, it's hard to kind of reflect it because it just looks ostensibly really, really silly, but there is a kind of, it's, it's a powerful thing, that's a club created for the, these leading political society figures during the First World War, so they're all kind of, it is an identity, and Lady Lundry at the centre of this, knowing exactly what's going on at all times, so it's just kind of, it's, it's not just for a fancy dress party, it is something more to it than, than that. It is of interest just to find these records, because very little is known about the art. 
I mean, I would love to find out what went on. Unfortunately, we won't know because the Berkshire plant arrived. She died that year. She wasn't able to do it in 1959. So the next part of my talk, I'm going to look at <clears throat> letters from the Western Front. These are correspondence bypass military censorship without a doubt because there's things being mentioned that shouldn't be mentioned to some of you, this is closest friends or confidants and gives you an idea of the magnitude of her friendships with people that she is getting this information sent through to her in the very early stages of the war I mean for example General Putney, commander of the British 3rd Army, the 4th Army I can't remember now, uh, commander throughout the war, general throughout the war Famous Battle of the Marne, I think the Germans had, had, had retreated in September. Comes across the chateau and he's kind of complaining about there being the brutes that drunk all the champagne. It's kind of been frivolous. It shows you kind of the kind of, you know, what General Putney expects. He expects her to be champagne in a French chateau. There's this sort of early stage of the war where it's not particularly terrible. People are, are retreating and it's, there is this kind of great adventure view. But I mean, General Putney's correspondence changes throughout the course of the war. It gets darker and darker and more somber. And you know the the words are literally spilling off the page as it goes on. This is a very very early letter. It's General William Putney there, again writing by Ver Verdun. Of the illustration we found recently, General Putney, again Verdun trap talking to later, but also mentioning you know the guns, the 800 guns. You know he shouldn't be saying that. You know in, in, in correspondence that kind of information would be censored, military censorship. But he's sending these reports by. The tongue does change, as I mentioned earlier. Another, another gentleman, another friend of hers, is Captain William Cavendish Bentick, future Duke of Portland. And again, this is a kind of dark day in amongst many dark days, but this is one that really stands out in the, in the history of the First World War. Because this is the day where gas is used for the first time. 22nd of April. So the, the second battle of Ypres, when it's in 1915, and gas is used, and the gas is in a, a four-mile line salient of French colonial troops, or Zouaves, as they call it. The gas is heavier than air, so it sits in the trench, and forces the men out, and they are described within 10 minutes of dying like fish in a draining pond. It's that horrific. Bentick's job is to go and get the men back in the line at gunpoint, and Benson describes this vividly, you know, this, this scene as what's happening to these soldiers with this gas coming in, densely sitting in the trenches and forcing them out. The Germans, of course, won't get this break in the line to exploit it. And um, it's just, my, this could just be described as hellish. There's no other word for it. Again, poison gas attack. In the letter from to Abs, you left the trenches in a heavy fire, lost, lost their heads, shooting out their own troops. So there's pandemonium and chaos, really, the effects of this gas that no one had witnessed. They're having gas in the Eastern Front, in, in, I think, Tannenberg, Russia, or around that time, but not in the West. This is the first time this has been witnessed in the Western Front, so nobody seemed to know what to do about it. But the effects of it became clear extremely quickly. Again, the second battle of Apes and the Dammit's done in the lovely Cathedral St. Martin. And the kind of nature of these lovely Flemish towns being reduced. St. Peter's Church. So the correspondence is coming back to Lady Lundry from this, from this scene, which you can see, you can only be described as absolutely hellish. Uh, this part of the talk, I just think it's very poignant. I always like to kind of end with this because this is the Royal Horse Guards, this is the Blues, the Elite Cavalry Regiment. Friend Bentick is writing to her very early days, 18th of August, to set off, you know, to set the French coast and we're cheering. You know, this kind of, these elite young officers and soldiers, cavalry troops, going out to this great, first time they'd ever seen France. For, for many of them, the first time they'd ever seen France, and this great Elan and this great regiment, and then, you know, things change. Within a few short months, things change. Well, they're absolutely decimated. The cavalry's role was, was reduced, wasn't particularly effective anyway. But you can see some idea of, of the letters he's writing to her and the stats and the grim statistic between August, the cheering the hats, the French coast, 
the same unit regiment with this figure in a few short months. So these are just part of a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the laundry papers that we have here in Prony. And uh, thank you for your time. That's it. Thank you. Well, I've been tasked with speaking about women in the war. And I'm going to talk not only about how women interacted with the war, but how the war impacted on men as well. And from start to finish, women were heavily involved. I know most people tend to think this was a boys' toys type of event, but it really wasn't. Um, first person I'm going to talk about is Charlotte Despard. Charlotte Despard, a member of the aristocracy. Um, very active, a total embarrassment to her family, therefore a hero of mine. Um, she was very heavily involved in the suffrage movement and in social justice. She actually ended up her days working in the East End of London among the poorest of the poor to try and uh, encourage health and education and so on. She spoke out heavily against the war and you can see from this extract from part of her diary where she went to London at Trafalgar Square the workers were holding a demonstration. She was helped on to the stage because they recognised her as a quite a, even though she was a woman, she was a political figure even though she didn't have the vote. Um, but she did put forward a resolution that Britain should not take, play, take part in this war. Now, the crowd who were gathered there unanimously supported her. Unfortunately, um, as we all know, that didn't actually happen. But the nice thing about the women, um, they did keep a lot of diaries without other things to distract them. Keeping a diary was a very ladylike, genteel thing to do, which is great because we have a lot of very vivid first-hand accounts of what they thought, what they felt, and particularly for high-ranking women, how they were connected. So, from the 4th of August, when war was declared, she says, at midnight on Tuesday, war was proclaimed, and now everything is in commotion. Kitchener is war minister. Jack, that was her brother, Sir John French, inspector general, and I wrote to him. So she's probably telling her brother harder on the war. He's probably not listening to her. So. 5th of August, the day went slowly, again, German reverses, gallant Belgium making a stand, etc. Um, another quad at home. And then this nice one, tea and conversation. War the one topic. News of German reverses, seven regiments surrender. Mr. Paul said the war will be over by September. Now there's an optimist. Most people were saying it would be over by Christmas. He thought it would be over in two months. As well as uh, Charlotte Despard, uh, another very notable dairyist was Lillian Spender, again a very well connected woman politically. Um, her husband Wilfred had actually resigned his commission uh, in protest of home rule, but anyway, when we got home I found Wilfred had phoned me and when I rang him up he told me that a rumour had been through that Germany had declared war and that in all probability he would be wired for that night. So. He and I packed the things so we would be ready if the wire came. That's a telegraph for those people not old enough to remember. <laughs> so, um, we had to go downtown to dine, as the servants weren't expecting us. I think that's a lovely line that just gives you a, a glimpse into a totally different world. You know, you don't just open the fridge and put something in the microwave. You go downtown to dine if the servants aren't there. So they saw the scare headlines, and again. As they expected, there was a telegram waiting for him when he came home. So all his things were packed and off he went. And she writes at the bottom, It was horrible to have him go off like that and to be left behind. And for a lot of women, that's exactly what happened. They were left behind. Now, again, um, I'm not sure if my colleagues mentioned this, but again, I'm going to reiterate, there was no conscription in Ireland. This meant that a lot of the uh, jobs in that men used to do in England, who were then called up and women went in and did their jobs, didn't happen. But that didn't stop women being involved. And women were very good at encouraging other people. Um, I've used several uh, cartoons of the day from the Punch magazine because they just hit the nail on the head so aptly. This is a nearsighted old woman. Uh, going to Now look at that young fellow. A couple of months in the army would make a new man of him. As she points to a cardboard cutout of Charlie Chaplin. You know. So women were encouraging their men folk to go. 
Again, Lily and Sven are going, we went to the cinema, life was going on pretty much as normal. It was infuriating to sit there and see rows of young men peacefully smoking and enjoying the spectacle. Unfortunately, I couldn't say much as I was sitting beside Mr. Bland, who has not volunteered. He has just been offered a very good new appointment, which he doesn't think he ought to lose a chance of at his time of life. But if it doesn't come off, he means to go soldiering somehow. Of course, I think he ought to go anyhow, but one can't say so to a stranger. Now, that's only if you're well-bred, obviously. Other people were doing much more um, vigorous campaigning. And of course, you would get the official posters and it would be to the young women of Ireland. Is your best boy wearing khaki? If not, do you not think he should be? You know, if he doesn't think you're worth fighting for, is he really worthy of you? You know, so they're getting this insidious, you know, try and encourage your men to go. And of course, the dramatic women of Britain say go. So I love these sort of very melodramatic posters, but they did seem to work. And as my colleague said, women took part in a lot of fundraising. This image was document of the month. We were all obliged practically to put it into our talk. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, there's quite a lot of fundraising went on. People would definitely come together for various um, things. This is a nice idea. I've just taken extracts out of this book, The Killy Lay Women's War Work and Patriotic Effort. Um, people give subscriptions. They held cake fairs, sales and concert. What I particularly liked was the old Crocs football match. You know, so you have all sorts of varieties of things, of ways of raising money. So there was a lot of normal activity going on during these war years. And the Guild also provided things like socks and cardigans and so on. They also produced a World War I, well, the wartime cookbook, as it was known as. And I think, again, this is a lovely image because one of the first casualties of war are the rations, and eggs were in short supply. So we have about 10 recipes of how to make eggless cakes. This seemed to be very, very popular. I can make an eggless cake. So you've got uh, economical cake without eggs, eggless cake number one, eggless cake number two, and so on. Eggless plum cake was another. And of course, that all sounds very genteel, as I'm sure you'll agree, but it did actually help to raise morale. And you would get people like this as a letter from a soldier at the front, going, Dear Miss Maxwell, I'm glad to learn that you're baking a cake, as it is wanted at present, for we cannot buy any out here, now where we are. And I would be very thankful to you if you could oblige me with some socks and a pair of gloves, as it's very cold. So not only are they being sent cakes and other goodies, but you know the soldiers are asking back for what they want that's not part of their uniform. And again, a lovely punch cartoon of the history of a pair of mittens, as a lovely young lady there tries to take up knitting and uh, knits as well as I do by the look of her, <laughs> but they still get put to good use. Now, knitting, again, a very genteel occupation that, you know, yeah. Yeah, and again, we have lovely letters. Thank you so much for the knitted socks you have so kindly have done for me. They're really awfully nice and warm. Socks, are you, as you may be sure, are always needed in the trenches under the present weather, which I must say is really terrible. It has, in fact, rained for the best part of the present turn in the trenches. Now, the reason why fresh, clean socks were very, very welcome was because of a condition known as trench foot. And trench foot, as you would imagine again, would be pre very prevalent during the way they fought the war. For those of you of a delicate position, I should have given you a warning there, sorry about that. But trench foot was very debilitating. As you can see, it actually ended in amputations in an awful lot, lot of cases. People were actually assigned a foot bodies so that they would look after each other's feet. Because we were standing in the damp and wet for many, many hours, this condition was prevalent. So uh, knitting socks. I'll take you away from that. <laughs> but knitting socks, although it sounded like very genteel, very, well, not very thoughtful, not very worldly, it was actually really crucial to help win the war because it kept more men at the front. Now, talking of trenches, this is a nice picture of Lady Londonry, who my colleague spoke of, inspecting the trenches, obviously many years after the war. And as he pointed out, she was a member of the WA, she was allowed to go without restriction, uh, back and forward. 
Now, it is said that she did go to see her husband. Others have suggested there was other young men that she was interested in seeing, but I'm not going into that. <laughs> um, she did do the volunteer drivers, and again, provided them with uniforms, and very lovely they are too. She also provided hospital beds and training for nurses, so the Zelser Volunteer Force Hospital, the Mountjoy Ward. And a lot of women did want to join up as nurses. Um, and one of the interesting aspects of this was that an awful lot of the upper class, the landed gentry, the ladies who had never worked a day in their lives, were very keen to go and join up. Here we have Lady Hermione Blackwood and Miss de Sauté offering to work for the Scottish Women's Hospital and Foreign Service. They're sort of giving the brush off a wee bit. But a lot of these people did join up and most of them uh, tried to join the, v the VAD, the Voluntary Aid Detachment. And I've written, permission to write a poem, sir. Again, that is a contemporary cartoon, I think it's amazing. And this is an ode written by a, uh, a wounded soldier to a VAD. I'm not going to read out all of it, you'll be glad to hear. Um, but it goes, there's an angel in our ward as keeps splitting to and fro with fit the eyes upon her wherever she may go. She's as pretty as a picture and as bright as Mercury and she wears the cap and apron of a VAD. She's an honourable miss because her father is a duke. Uh, sorry, pigeon English there. But the Lord you'd never guess it and it ain't no good to look for her portrait in the illustrated papers for you see. She's quit on an advertiser to be our VAD. But it basically shows you that even there, people were aware that it was upper class ladies who were coming to smooth their fevered brow. Um, I think a lot of them had a nice romantic image of how this would really be. And I'm sure they also got a very rude awakening. And obviously, we're here to launch the book by Trevor on Emma Duffin's diaries. And Emma was only one of several sisters. Emma, Sylvia and Cecilia all served as nurses. Uh, during the First World War, the second. And I'm particularly going on to read just a little bit. I don't want to steal his thunder. But just to let you know what a voluntary aid detachment as a nurse would be like. I was sent on duty on the station platform, and if the hospital had not made me realise the war, I realised it that night. Under the big arc lights in the station lay stretchers four deep. So close one could scarcely get one feet between them, all down both platforms. At the end were the walking cases. They were past walking, and the majority had lain down huddled together, their arms and slings and their heads bound up, the mud from the trenches sticking to their clothes, and the blood still caked on them. I walked up and down all night, feeling I was in a bad dream. And I think from that, and that's one of the um, less uh, frantic episodes, that's quite restrained compared to some of the, the passages in the diaries. Um, Emma was also a very, very, very um, accomplished illustrator. So again, she did this lovely little cartoon and sketch of a bad nightmare. You know, having too much work to do, obviously. So I think that's quite good. So while she was doing that, it meant she was on my downtime, and there was some downtime time, time for these nurses. They would have to have time to recuperate. They'd work very long, hard shifts, but then they would have rest periods. And to try and keep morale, morale up, they would put on various variety shows and so on. I'm sure you've all seen it was an eight half hot mum or something of that nature, but this would happen in the hospitals as well. These are photographs from Jean Montgomery. Uh, she took several photographs of various wards and so on. Um, this is Nurse Goodman and Private Pepper. I don't think he ever did make it to sergeant, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and various other ward sisters are mentioned there. This is a, a hospital at Lahar where the those who had fought at Blighty were sent before going. To <coughs> and while you were working in the hospitals, there were things that happened. As a, if you are working in a hospital full of men just in from the trenches, you are not working in the best and most hygienic of situations. And a few of the things you had to put up with were lice, head lice, nits, etc. So it was taken first of all as a hygienic measure 
to cut the hair. Now this sounds really strange, we're all used now to wearing short hair, I'm sure quite a few of us in the audience are. But the First World War was the first time that women deliberately cut their hair short. They would have done it beforehand as a punishment, if someone had been being naughty and they wanted to show her they didn't approve, they would cut her hair. If she was very ill, they would cut the long hair off to, so it wouldn't pull her strength out. But this was the first time people actually did it voluntarily, although not all of them did, because you can see from this. This evening I cut off the hair of nearly all the unit, starting with my own. Then with that of Edith Harley's, whose beautiful long hair I was loath to sacrifice. Then off came Sister Duff's hair, then Sister Flora Mackenzie's. The latter called out, Oh my good hair, oh my good hair, please don't cut it off. So a lot of people took three different... Some people were actually quite glad to, for the feeling of freedom and liberty it gave them. Others, it was like losing part of their soul. And it wasn't just the hair that made a change. Obviously if you were working as a driver, as a factory worker or whatever, as in this case a Scottish Women's Hospital where all the lifting, packing and carrying was done by the women, including great cases, bales of mattresses, tents, etc. You can't really do that with the heavy old-fashioned stays and corsets. So women started to literally loosen their stays, they started to shorten their skirts, they started to be more freedom of movement, and this was again a big step forward for literally freedom of one kind. Um, they needed it just to be practical, but of course the practicality became a give way to fashion, and of course this led on to the fashions of the 20s, the short skirts, the charged era and so on. Um, but also give rise to a lot of comment and speculation, and again a lovely cartoon. A first officer in a spasm of jealousy. Who's the knock kneed chap with your sister, old man? And the second officer says, my other sister. <laughs> Because again, the first time they wore trousers. But trousers were practical, particularly if you were working in the munitions factories. And this young lady, who was a worker in Mackey's factory in the Springfield Road, as it was then, it's estimated that the Mackey's produced 75 million shells in the duration of the war. And the women also produced a weekly magazine. Mackey's magazine on the Turnip Turn Lather's Friend. Now, this magazine was produced by the women themselves, and it had a, quite a range of things within it. A lot of it was scurrilous office gossip, great to read. Unfortunately, I don't always know who they were talking about, but it was very bitchy, I think is the only word I can use for it. Um, it was also very funny, and they were also quite arty. Uh, this is just one part of a poem. Again, I'm going to read it, but there's lots more to it. Mary makes munitions, though at first she had ambitions towards nursing sick or working on the land. But the wounded failed to charm her, and she didn't like the farmer, so she thought it other work should try her hand. She left the farm in Carrow, came to job to find a job. She said she wanted something nice, she told her friend. But the bank she had in view promptly said she wouldn't do, so she had to go to Mackey's in the end. Now, this goes on for several more verses, and goes on about her alleged affair with an office worker, but that's another story, you'll just have to get it out and have a look yourself. Also, um, I do have here, hopefully if it works, this is a short silent film from, um, it's from the National War Museum, but it is very similar to the conditions that would have applied to the women in Mackey's. It only lasts a couple of minutes, and they do look very um, shy that they're being filmed here. But again, they're wearing trousers, they've got their hair either cut or tied up. It's mainly women, there's very few men in sight. And I do like their practical way of uh, putting the colour. If that was in colour, you'd be able to see that the, the actual shells are being colour-coded. So it's quite a clever little way. But it must be quite fast breaking work though. So anyway, I think that's probably... Well, it's not that long, so I'll let it run just. So I think I do have time.
It gives you a nice idea of how many shells are actually there. You'll see that they do stretch over most of the floor. Now, so as I say, throughout the war, women were doing a lot. There's a, um, whether it was sitting at home, encouraging people, knitting socks, making... Sorry, it's good. But even towards the end of the war, they still had their input. This is a photograph of Miss uh, Monia Mitchell, an American woman, and she was allegedly the originator of the red Flanders poppy as a modern day symbol of remembrance. She was actually inspired by a poem, and again this poem, although not written by a woman, it did appear in a lot of, it was so evocative that it was reproduced a lot of times, and when she saw it, she was inspired to move. So I'm going to read the poem. In Flanders fields the poppies blow between the crosses row and row that mark our place, and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amidst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from falling hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. So the first Flanders field memorial poppy was sold on the 9th of November 1918. The British Legion now distributes over 40 million poppies a year. And again, that was done because a woman had the idea. I would say that throughout the First World War in particular, women's efforts helped to shorten it or prolong it, depending on what way you look at it. They fought against it, they encouraged people to go for it, they did their best. It had an impact on them, they had an impact on it, and I think it's something that we should really remember. Thank you. Um, when the Great War broke out in August 1914, the War Office later estimated that at least 23,000 committed and educated young volunteers, mostly of women, uh, throughout Britain, Ireland and the British Empire, uh, enlisted in the voluntary aid detachment of the Red Cross and the St John's Ambulance. In Ireland, about 2,300 volunteered, of whom only about 150 are believed to have served abroad. There are a number of published reminiscences that relate the VADs as they became known. Among these, perhaps the most widely recognised is Vera Britton's Chronicle of Youth, 1913-17, published in 1981, in which the mother of the Baroness Shirley Williams uh, records her early days as an Oxford Somerville graduate, her relationship with the poet Roland Lighton, uh, and following her poignant recording of the news of Lighton's death uh, on the front line at, in Christmas 1915, she herself joined the VAD and served abroad. Emma Duffin, born in Belfast in 1883, likewise applied at the age of 31, by which time she had achieved... Mm. See, you, you keyboards throw me completely. Ah. Emma Duffin, born in Belfast, likewise applied at the age of 31, by which time she had achieved some standing, as um, Anne said, as an illustrator of children's books, to enlist as a VAD nurse. She was called up in September uh, 1915, uh, reported to London, um, and was immediately sent by boat to Alexandria in Egypt, where she spent the next six months in the wards. Uh, tending to casualties evacuated from Gallipoli. Uh, until then, the most uh, concentrated military engagement encountered by the British Army, that's April 1915. On her return from service abroad, she re-enlisted and in April 1916 was sent to number two General Hospital in Le Havre and Calais, where until the end of the war, she would nurse the wounded, Allied and German soldiers alike, as they were stretched in in increasingly large numbers from the Western Front. Emma was the fourth daughter of Adam and Maria Duffin, nine children. At the age of 16, all seven of the Duffin girls attended Cheltenham Ladies College, an indication of the family's wealth, perhaps, but more, more uh, importantly, a strong uh, commitment to education. 
This at a time when girls' education was not seen as being much of a priority. When Emma went to Cheltenham Ladies College at the age of 16 in May 1900, the Duffin family were located at 22 University Square. Soon after, her address is given as Dun Owen on the Cliftonville Road, alongside Cliftonville Cricket Ground, as it then was. And this remained the family home until the death of her father, Adam Duffin, in 1924, whereupon the family moved to Summerhill in Strandmillis. Emma's, Emma's mother, Maria, was 13 years her husband's junior and lived to be 100, dying in 1954. She herself was the granddaughter of Dr. William Drennan, a founding member of the Society of United Irishmen when it was established in Belfast in October 1791. The 1911 census records everyone in the household as Unitarian, that's non-subscribing Presbyterian, except for the two Catholic maids. The family worshipped in All Souls non-subscribing church in Elmwood Avenue and then later in Rosemary Street. Three of Emma's sisters, Celia, Dorothy and Olive, also served in World War I as VAD though Emma was the only one to serve abroad. And one of her two brothers, Captain Terence Duffin, served in the 36th Ultra Division, where he was awarded the Military Cross. These members of the Duffin family are, in, uh, are interesting personalities in their own right, of course, and are worth following up in the extensive Duffin family archive that's been mentioned previously, D2109, in case you're interested. Ruth the Eldest was the first warden of Riddle Hall at Strandmillis, Major Terence died in 1936, possibly from the effects of wartime injuries. He had married the daughter of Sir Arthur Sluggett, head of the Royal Army Medical Corps throughout World War I. Emma herself, to complete her education as it were, went to Germany as an au pair in 1911 and spent the year she spent in Germany, so close to the outbreak of the war, gave her an almost unique perspective on her work as a nurse, especially as we'll see when she had to tend wounded German prisoner soldiers. But the focus of this talk is on Emma herself. The diaries in which she recorded her World War I experiences were not written up on a daily basis as a normal diary. Instead, she appears to have written the five closely written volumes uh, um, as soon as she returned uh, from, the, from uh, the front in 1919. The early entries in her diary do not give much indication that she was from the first aware that it would be of great historical interest later on. She received her call-up papers in September 1915, and the first entry records the excitement and haste prompted by the arrival of her call-up papers. Thursday, 9th, 19th, Thursday, September the 9th, 1915. I came in at one o'clock to find a letter saying I was to report myself in London at St John's Gate and start for Egypt on Saturday. I had to dash around getting things ready. I crossed to Hesham that night. There was one or two other St John people on board. Miss Miss Russell, who later became a very good friend of hers, of Downpatrick, one from Stranora and one from Galway. Fred Hine, another well-known family name, was crossing on his way back to drive a motor ambulance in France after a week's leave. He sat beside me and talked for a long time. He said most of his work was done by night, but had never been under fire. When she arrived in London, she found that she was bound for Egypt, and her description of the shipboard journey from uh, convey something of the excitement and confusion, even the tolerable misery of seasickness of a hundred and so volunteers, all lumped together, all female, and all competing uh, for the, the, the side of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> On arrival, Emma was posted at number 15 General Hospital in Alexandria, where she served to the spring of 1916. Her first impression of the war she served in visi visibly, <coughs> vividly described the sense of panic she had to suppress when first she went on duty. To my unaccustomed eye, she said, all the patients seemed dying, and I was suddenly struck by the terror of the whole thing. On the way out, we had pictured ourselves nursing wounded only. We had never thought of illness somehow. Here was something the result of war, just as surely as any wounds, and somehow it seemed even more terrible. I sat there terrified. She noted early on the air of disapproval of professional nurses with whom she had to work. Um, however, as time wore on, the VAD nurses, untrained though they were, uh, proved themselves more than capable of helping the medical services cope with the increasing casualties, and that distance that was initially noticed um, gradually was diminished, not entirely. Not only was there a significant proportion of the soldiers in her care, largely Anzac, Australian and New Zealand, being shipped out of Gallipoli, but she also encountered Australian and New Zealand, and, and most commonly of all, perhaps, South African among her nursing colleagues. 
she refers sometimes scathingly to their whiny colonial accents. Uh, many, indeed, the majority were South African, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand, which in addition to fellow Irish and the Scottish contingent, served as a reminder of the extent to which the First World War was not only fought for, but by the British Empire. The nights we dreaded, she said, were when uh, I had been a convoy, and the beds which had only been vacated that afternoon were filled again with gaunt and burning-eyed patients. She recalls trying to restrain a nice curly-haired boy. He looked at me with burning, unseeing eyes. My two chums, my two chums died at each side of me on this boat. Wouldn't you want to get out and see what, if your mother, if you were dying? He said pathetically. We're not going to let you die, I said confidently. But alas, he died the next night. Having served in nine, Christmas 1915, having served for three demanding months on the wards in Alexandria. Emma allowed herself what was almost her first moment of reflection as she retired to bed on Christmas night. They had allowed the whole day to the patients, so all the staff, even those who were deserving of a day off, had come in and had made the day uh, conscious that the soldiers were so far from home in Alexandria uh, and tried to make something of a, uh, an effort to make it as homely a Christmas as possible. Um, she allowed herself what was almost her first moment of reflection on that night as she retired to bed. The medical staff had agreed they would work that Christmas day. At the end of a long and emotionally draining day, she reflected. We got home about 12 o'clock and tumbled into bed, utterly exhausted. I thought of the only other Christmas I had spent away from home, in Germany. We had visited a hospital there and sung German carols outside the wards, and I wondered if they'd done it this year. I thought of the patients singing hymns and it had given me a lump in my throat to see, to see some of them so terribly ill, unworn, yet singing. Peace on earth, goodwill to all men. We were all singing it. And no doubt the Germans were doing the same thing. And what a farce it would seem to an outsider. And what hypocrites we ought to appear. I gave it up as a bad job and went to sleep. Her description of local culture and lifestyle in Alexandria celebrate the diversity she found there. At one level she was entertained to tea by European residents. At another, she enjoyed the chaotic diversions of taking rides with local garries, uh, carriages, um, and her artist's eye looked approvingly on the colourful clothes worn in the markets and on the streets. Her great disappointment comes at the end when, having been promised time off to go to Cairo, she's not allowed to go. Emma's application to serve for a second term of six months was accepted. She was posted to France in late May 1916, just in time, as she observed, for the big push that would see the onset of the Battle of the Somme. In the interim, however, events in Ireland in the form of the Easter Rebellion in Dublin, beginning on the 24th of April that year, an event that would have long-term implications for the whole island, meant that she had to have a passport coach even to leave Ireland, as she observed. On arrival in the Havre, she was posted initially to the isolation hospital. It had just been assimilated as part of Number 2 General Hospital, which served as a military hospital in the port. She soon completed her stint in isolation and was posted to La Gare, the great railway station which had been transformed into a hospital. Le Havre was a port from which thousands of wounded troops, when they were fit enough to be sent back to Britain, were dispatched. The patients she tended were too seriously injured to be transferred to, by boat to Britain immediately. It was on her first day in Le Havre that she encountered the full extent of the pitiless wounds inflicted by trench warfare. The soldiers she attended were all fresh from the trenches and their hands and feet caked in mud and most of their clothes had to be cut off. <coughs> Sorry, that was uh, some uh, images with um, her patients. Uh, she herself uh, took a, a camera with her, being the illustrator and the, uh, of the artist's eye, and so was able to bring, uh, take a good record of her time there. And so it's unusual enough to find nurses with patients. Uh, and it's in the archive, and a very valuable resource it is too. Um, French hotels throughout our, France, northern France anyway, were transformed as hospitals, um, such as this one in France. The, and then when um, she went to Le Havre, she was able to take some further photographs, uh, such as these. The soldiers she attended were all fresh in the trenches. The work was unrelenting, and Emma frequently makes a comment, usually in a matter-of-fact, rather complaining tone, about how strenuous she found it. When the convoys, convoys arrived, quote, we worked all night, and when she was sent on duty to work on the platform, receiving wave upon wave of wounded, she observes, if the hospital had not made me realise the war, I realised it that night, 
Stretchers four deep, so close one can scarcely fit one's feet between them, all the way down the path. <coughs> it was not only the responsibility of the care of so many seriously ill soldiers that she found so wearing, but the demands of very difficult cases. Though she was always quick to point that instances of obstreperous and difficult patients were in fact very rare. It may be worth pointing out that the priority was to get the less seriously, as I said, soldiers shipped from the Southampton Shed, as it was called, to, to England to where they would receive treatment. She said, I found night duty in three wars pretty strenuous. The hard boy, as she called it, uh, was a great trial. He refused to take his medicine or any nourishment, refused to be washed, even raising his fist and using awful language. I hate you, nurse, he said to me one day. And on another occasion, he even used the Pygmalion word, bloody, if you remember, he lies bloody. <laughs> do, do little use of the word bloody. And it's interesting that uh, when she was on leave and went to London, she sometimes went to the theatre and uh, Pygmalion, or Pygmalion as my English teacher used to call it, um, uh, was first produced in 1915. So it's not beyond the bounds of reasonable thinking that Emma may have been uh, at the performance and would certainly would have appreciated the free song that the use of the word bloody on stage first made. The strain of coping with a constant stream of serious casualties was only slightly offset by her determination to have some sort of alternative life, even though off-duty time, which ought to have been half a day a week to which BAD nurses were entitled, was seriously limited. In this context, although she continued to find it almost impossible to sleep during the day when she was, as she constantly seemed to be on night duty, <coughs> she used her time off during the day to bathe in the sea. She had to be accompanied by another female to do so. She was not allowed to bathe alone uh, in the sea to which the Avril posting gave her access, of course. It was in one of these seaside visits that she became something of a heroine, being involved in the rescue of three children who had got into difficulty on the shoreline. It was the Southampton Shed that she uh, made, made most impact on her. She recalls being on duty in the Southampton Shed, quote, an enormous hangar of several hundred beds and marvelling at the cheerfulness of the troops who, though wounded, were relieved in the knowledge that they were homeward bound. The men were only detained until a boat came, she said. They had all had their blighty tickets on, and ever full of spirit and chaff and helping each other. One big Highlander with a wound in his leg gave a wild yell, in a, and in answer to my look of surprise, he said, Jim's my pal, we were over the top together, and I haven't seen him since. <laughs> uh, the accent comes free. <laughs> It was in the Southampton Shed that Emma first encounters German prisoners who, com who competed for her medical attention with the more deserving, as the nurses called it, Allied soldiers. Her observation, quotes, one could not but feel sorry for them, the German prisoners, for their condition was even worse than her own men. And there were, they were prisoners as well, bearing testimony to the humanitarian instincts that characterised the whole diary, in fact. It came as something of a relief to the constant demands of caring for the seriously wounded when she was sent to the officer's hospital, where officers who had fallen sick were tended. And it is interesting to know that Emma, herself from a distinctively middle-class family, uh, education and upbringing, makes the observation that in this new environment, she quotes officers instead of other ranks, at first I felt shy, which I never had with the Tommies, as she called them. Mm -hmm. Working conditions and accommodation arrangements at the quay, um, where, quotes, the discomfort and, co sorry, the cold and discomfort was horrid, did not make it any easier, the constant demands of coping with serious cases. Quotes. She said, work as hard as we could. We never seemed to get through the work. Every day the men went to the theatre. There were endless amputations. In spite of this unrelenting pressure, when Emma was offered the chance to be sent back to Officer's Hospital, where the pace was much more sedate, her decision was typically that there, quotes, there was no question whether, where it was doing better work, uh, or dusting and carrying up officers' ma meals and she opted to remain at the quay, where the work was um, proportionately more difficult. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of 1916, Emma was rededicated, reallocated to the Palais de Regat, um, a converted superior hotel, very picturesquely situated at the fashionable end of Le Havre, right on the sea, at the opposite end from the quay where she had from it. The posting came after she had suffered the first of several bouts of illness, not unrelated to the Spartan working conditions uh, of living and working uh, in what was really a transport, transformed uh, station. And when she had just returned from first leave, she spent part of her leave in London, where she had gone to the theatre, as I say. 
VAD members had their journeys to and from the Havre uh, paid. However, as Emma ruefully observed, a fortnight's leave, especially when the journey to Ireland is counted as part of your leave, uh, soon goes, to, all, goes all too soon. And although she finds herself working in the company of VADs with whom she struck up a warm relationship, she readily admitted that she found the work at the Palais very coach tame. Most of the patients were what she called up patients, who walk around, not bedridden and requiring constant dressings. The entry of the United States in the war earlier in, the, in 1917 had repercussions for the nursing staff in the Havre, especially the VADs. Emma comments that in June 1917, number one general hospital in Etretat, further down the coast, uh, close to the Havre, was, quote, taken over by the Americans, and then we were inundated by sisters and VADs waiting to be disposed of, so there were plenty of VADs around. Consequently, there was for a time in the middle of 1917 not much work and she returned from her summer leave, fearing that she was to be moved yet again. When she did return from leave in late September, uh, her, first week fe her worst fears were realised, and she was eventually allocated to the Hotel des Emigrants, uh, known to the nurses as emigrants. Emma found it, uh, as predicted, quote, a gloomy, dingy old hole. Everyone in number two general dreaded being sent there. She attributed the pro pro proliferation of bugs, as she called them, as a, quote, a legacy from the emigrants, referring to the previous role of the hostelry, whose clientele had been the flood of often persecuted emigrants struggling to leave Europe via the Havre, bound to the <laughs> promised land of the United States. And although the living and working conditions improved, she was weighed down by the double burden of night duty, to which she could never get used, and the fact that she was lonely. That the professional nurses in her ward made no attempt to include her in their company. Though when Plumpton, a long-term VAD companion and friend, was posted Alongside her, it became more manageable, though interestingly and sadly, Plumpton uh, had to return home to England to, to support her father when her, Plumpton's brother, was killed in action. Emma's ability to communicate in the German language stood her in good stead when it came to dealing with the increasing numbers of wounded German prisoners. She tells of two German prisoners, both very seriously wounded, and laments the callousness shown by her fellow nurses to their treatment. An instance that particularly shocked her arose in the treatment of a young uh, a German to whom she had uh, grown attached. His pitiful cry, this is a uh, Max uh, Zubrot, she just called him a little hun. Uh, and he was known as, there was no uh, sort of politically incorrect now, uh, quite cheerfully just referred to the hun. And he used, used the word hunnish as an adjective as well, mm -hmm. as we'll see. She says his pitiful cries, uh, don't touch the wound sister, don't touch the wound, and slowly, slowly, please sister, slowly were terrible to hear, and he used to feel quite done up after his dressing. A morning or two later when I came on I was told he was dead. It was a relief, but I was sorry I had not been with him, especially when her poor caliber, one of her colleagues, who could not understand German, told me that he had called out for her uh, in uh, Schwester, Schwester, Fini, Fini. I missed him for many days long after. Emma had in, many case, in any case been appalled by one of the main sisters, whom she didn't like, and who rounded on her by saying, as when she arrived after the German had died, Well, Miss Duffin, your little hun is dead. He did the most hunnish thing he could do and died at six o'clock when we were at our busiest. <laughs> Emma notes in her diary, I did not deign to reply, but doubted if a German woman could have made a more hunnish speech on the death of a poor boy dying in, in agony. In the spring of 1918, Emma found herself back at the quay, where she was, quote, kept pretty busy with uh, convoys, which arrived very much as a matter of routine. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the new developments she and her medical colleagues had to cope with was the treating of soldiers for the inhalation of poison gas, a weapon recently introduced in the front. More than that, Emma finds herself Attention nauseous please. after coping with Documents the gas men, cannot be ordered after only to find that she herself has a, acquired no secondary gas poisoning arising from her contact with the soldiers' clothing. Thank you for your cooperation. In addition to the pro problems posed by treating soldiers for gas inhalation, the first wave became apparent in the spring of 1918 of what was to become known as Spanish flu, mm -hmm. and whose later waves would wreak havoc with medical staff and combatants <laughs> alike just when their resistance after four years of conflict was at its lowest. True to form, Emma herself becomes a flu victim. 
The success of the Allies from the late spring of 1918 sees the arrival of yet more convoys of German wounded prisoners. Emma's humanity comes to the fore again. Enemies are not, she said. They had terrible wounds, and I hated to see them lying unwashed in the dirty linen blankets. Poignantly, when one of them, sensing that he would die soon, explains to her in German that he would be the third of his mother's three sons to be killed. Emma, when she comes on duty the next day to find that he has in fact died, just simply records, poor old German mother. America's entry into the war brought her in contact with wounded soldiers, of whom she observed, I mean, wounded American soldiers, of whom she observed caustically. We are not very keen on our American patients. They seemed very nervy and funny about themselves. And as for American nursing staff, quotes, their ways were not our ways, was her dismissive comment. When she was told she had to be sent to Cali. But in a sense, it's the only time she becomes almost judgmental about her colleagues uh, in that sense. Um, she talks about the American nurses chassing their way down the ward <laughs> um, and uh, sort of waving goodbye to their boys. And a very poignant comment, she remembers that she too had done the same two years ago, and she also recalls. At how, how few of the boys that she had waved goodbye to had come back and she wondered how the Americans would, just, would respond uh, at a similar stage. Towards the end of the war, Emma was sent to Calais, the first and only posting she had outside Le Havre. When she told an Irish soldier where she was being sent, he replied earnestly, Don't go there, sister, don't go. It's bombed every night. Get transferred to the UVF hospital in Belfast. <laughs> As it turned out, she experienced regular air raids when she was posted to Calais. Quotes, it's like this every single night, she was told. And the consequent problems associated with evacuating staff and patients became apparent to her. Just as problematic was the work required in coping with patients affected by the successive waves of Spanish flu that was sweeping across the world and affecting troops. Emma found herself managing a new problem, how to look after female patients when she found, quotes, which she found, whom she found rather, more, quotes, much more difficult than the Tommies. Anne McVeigh in the earlier talk referred to the, uh, the Women's uh, Army uh, Auxiliary Corps, the WAAC, who had been brought in from 1917. Um, they were brought in as general service, um, and some of them served as general service VADs. Flu victims and where she found herself called on to act as a, she was, sorry, she was delegated to a ward where there were members of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, flu victims, and when she found herself called on to act as, quote, as she put it herself, a schoolmistress giving moral lectures when I found our big, dirty, rough orderly being embraced by three of them at once, <laughs> and when some of her, her VAD colleagues also indulged in light-hearted female badinage and exchanges, her comment was a prim. That was the worst, she said, having VAD of that class. But it does indicate the extent to which the VAD is having initially started off as a fairly middle class initiative in 1914 to 15, um, had spread its wings, if you like, socially speaking, um, and became uh, a bit more widespread. The news of the armistice uh, on the 11th of November 1918, three days after Emma's 35th birthday, prompted a great sense of celebration. And although the war was over, the care of patients still remained paramount. The full effects of that coup de grace of the First World War, the Spanish flu epidemic, was being felt by patients and staff alike. Consequently, Emma remained on duty, and it was not until this, the early months of 1919 that she herself was demobbed and was able to return to Belfast. Before she left, and typically, she took the opportunity to visit the nearby battlefields in northern France, where so many she attended had received their wounds. She arranged a completely unvoyeuristic uh, visit to Ypres with two Royal Army Medical Corps officers whom she knew. They took their cars, of course, which must have been part of the attraction. <laughs> After breakfast, she said, we packed into the motor car and started for Ypres. Both Captain Duncan and Mitchell had been on ammunition service up and down the line and could show us all the places. We met a padre walking in front of a lorry with a cover over its grim load, bodies being removed for burial. At Ypres, we got out of the car and explored the cathedral and cloth hall, or what was left of them, and took some photographs. And the two dark figures you can see are Emma and her colleague, um, with whom she had gone, 
Um, and you can see the deposition, which in, was in an image that uh, Anne McVeigh herself showed, um, of April 15. Emma had served as a voluntary aid detachment nurse continuously since September 1915. In acknowledgement of this and the loyal, unswerving, and dedicated service she gave in the cause of the care of the wounded, many of whom had little or no chance of surviving, she was awarded the honour of being mentioned in dispatches on the 30th of December 1918. Typically, she doesn't mention this in her diary. But you can see that all the, there's still diary there. And although the war was over, um, when she got home, um, she wrote up the diary, uh, from mainly from the letters uh, that she had sent home to her family, and many of them had been sent to her. Um, and it was only in 1967, when she obviously took the diaries out again, maybe not for the first time, but certainly in a more reflective way, she added this postscript. It had been a hard life, but a great experience never to be regretted. We had seen great suffering, but greater courage. Her admiration for the patience and stoicism of the soldiers she, she tended is, is quite unrestrained. We had learned to take responsibility and to act on our own when required. We had learned to be patient, to accommodate ourselves to different surroundings. We had learned the value of comradeship and that barriers between classes could be ignored. An orderly could be a friend as well as an officer. A patient could be a brother. To me, some of those men are more real than those I met perhaps a week ago. I can never forget them, as many I know will remember me. And she just rounds it up by saying, I was their sister in both senses. And of course, that was what I wanted to call the book, Their Sister in Both Senses. Uh, but the publishers decided that was too clever by half. <laughs> uh, but in the couple of minutes remaining, it might be useful, because she, had such, she was such an interesting person, uh, it might be useful just to skip on and uh, have a few images uh, from the rest of her career. As I say, she lived, she only died in 1979. Um, and that's her at the, box of, uh, the, uh, the box, at the gates of Buck Palace. I'm not quite sure what she's receiving there. Uh, as I say, she was mentioned in dispatches, but I don't think she ever received an official medal. What she did receive was the, an honorary MA in Queens in 1954, mm -hmm. and that's her. Uh, she was proposed for the MA by Professor E. Eston Evans, a well-known uh, historian and social anthropologist himself at Queen's University, uh, who also was involved in the formation of the um, Ulster Folk and Transport Museum in the middle of the 1950s. Uh, and I think Ruth, her elder daughter, eldest daughter, had herself been awarded an MA. Uh, and by Queen some years previously. Ruth was the first warden of uh, Riddle Hall, as I think I mentioned, and uh, was being recognised for that. But it, it was as an illustrator of books, children's books especially, but um, um, Celia and Ruth Duffin themselves were poets. Uh, two interesting publications, one before the war, The Secret Hill, published by uh, Monsell and Company in Dublin, uh, cover designed by Emma Duffin. Um, and that's part of the cover design. Uh, so that's from the Escape Poems. Their, their subsequent, I beg your pardon, their subsequent uh, publication in 1929. Also a volume of, of poems by Ruth and Celia Duffin. Escape. It published this time in London by Dent. And then Ruth Duffin also specialised in writing children's literature. There's a wonderful uh, sort of comment that. Uh, these are by a re uh, in a review of Ruth Duffin's children's books, which said, this is 1950s, they were published by Mullins, of course, the bookshop in Dauphin, which said that, you know, uh, s uh, parents who were horrified by the violence of comics like the Beano and the Topper uh, <laughs> would find much uh, solace in the pure innocence uh, of Miss Duffin's uh, publications. <laughs> Makes you think, eh? <laughs> and then that's some of her illustrations in the Fairy Cup. I mean, uh, Innocence Personified, and Handy Andy in the Wee House. <laughs> uh, and there's Handy Andy at work, it's adoring children. It's almost like Famous Five, isn't it? Even Blake and stuff. And then um, Reverend uh, 
David Stairs, uh, non-subscribing Presbyterian minister, came across this as an, an article, as an example of her Christmas card design, which she also, uh, Emma also specialised in. So that concludes my performance. Uh, I'd be welcome to.